All right, everyone. Hi, and welcome back to another Rust Lab talk. Uh, we have one more talk for you for Rust Lab by Nicola Martino, which will be about using Rust from JavaScript, a real life case. Uh, let's bring him on live really quickly just to say hi. Hi, everyone. I'm Nicola Martino, student of computer science from Turin, Italy. Hi, everyone. I work as a DevOps engineer and also as a developer for a company based in Turin. Uh, it's called uh, Myotical Labs. I want to first uh, thank you all for this great opportunity and for uh, your attention, hoping that uh, this can be useful to for who want to start playing with uh, Rust and uh, WebAssembly. So, thank Wonderful. you. Wonderful. Yeah, thanks for having us here. So, um, we're, we're really great to have you here, Nicola. And uh, just to explain the uh, talk for today, I'll read a little abstract and then we'll get started. So uh, starting from a spell checking problem, we want to showcase the process to reorganize, compile, deploy, and use a Rust library from JavaScript using Wasm and the ecosystem that the community has produced, uh, deepening three crucial stages, development, profiling, and opti optimization and integration into JavaScript project. Uh, with this talk, we will tell the process necessary to organize, compile, deploy, and use a simple Rust library using the WASM target and the ecosystem that the Rust community has produced over the years. We'll follow the steps we have taken, moving a spelling correction feature client side with Rust and WebAssembly. So um, was there anything else you'd like to add before we get started? No, I think that it's uh, completely correct. So Wonderful. Okay. All right, let's get started. Everyone enjoy and we'll bring him back on at the end to do a little bit of Q&A. So uh, if you do have questions to ask, please direct your questions to the Q&A chat under the chat headline, the little question mark. Uh, we'll keep them there just to keep things organized and then ask them at the end. So um, we'll go ahead and get started. Enjoy everyone. Hi everyone, I am Nicola Martino. I'm a student, uh, student of computer science at the University of Turin. I also work as a DevOps engineer and as a developer at Myotica Labs, a company based uh, also in Turin. I'm here to tell you the journey we took in order to use an existing Rust crate, compile it to targeting uh, WebAssembly and use it from uh, our front-end JavaScript code base. I want you to give you a brief introduction on what we wanted to do because I think it can be useful to frame the problem we had and how Rust and WebAssembly came to our rescue in solving it. We needed to uh, add to our e-learning platform a feature for spelling correction on the answers given by students before they submitted it. We wanted to do this to improve the automatic correction and to help teachers in the evaluation and review of the student works. Of course, the system was not supposed to prevent all the errors, but only annoying typing errors. After looking at some pre-built solution and also some mechanism already integrated in most web browsers, we quickly realized that none of them would work well in our use case, for very specific reasons tightly coupled with the platforms and the problem the platform itself aimed to solve. Most of the time, the user is requested to give free text answers in which more than one language appears. For example, there is a lot of logical and grammatical analysis to be done and a lot of translation work between languages like Italian uh, to Latin and Latin to Italian. This causes the user inputs to be spell-checked to be far complex multilingual texts. We have mainly to look for uh, entire sentences and not only single words to correct, where uh, in these sentences uh, one language is heavily interlaced with another one in uh, an almost indistinguishable way. Of course, for uh, a machine looking at it, for a human is a completely different task. We needed to address uh, also some quite complex topics, like handling uh, word segmentation issues to catch error like this one. I am the best, 
and uh, correct it, inserting the uh, missing uh, white space character. Also, we have to face the similarities and ambiguities between languages of the same family. In a text that, for example, mix Italian with Latin, one can face the problem that one word can be correct in one language, but can be marked as a typo with a very short distance uh, in another one. I quickly explain later this concept of distance for who is not familiar with it. For example, if I look at a sentence that looks like this one, similismente, it can be equally interpreted as similismente, with one Latin word and one Italian word, or similismente, that are two valid Italian words. Of course, this is a nonsense example, but I hope it gives some impression on the possible ambiguities involved in this process. Finally, most texts are about uh, uh, historical topics, like events, custom, and organization in a society very far from ours. That means that a lot of words are aulic and obsolete, as some of them cannot be uh, translated with uh, existing uh, words, but uh, uh, like more transliterated, but doesn't mean they are incorrect. They somehow form a sort of uh, specialized historical language that is not covered by most text corpora one can find uh, digging online. So we decided to leverage uh, the knowledge in our databases to build uh, our personal text corpus based, based uh, on years of already review question and answers. After looking at uh, some algorithms, we decided to pick the symmetric delete spelling correction algorithm. The symmetric delete spelling correction algorithm is a proud member of the edit distance spelling correction family which is based on the concept of quantifying how dissimilar are to string one from another by counting the minimum number of operations needed to transform one string into the another one. The most known metric for quantifying uh, this uh, concept of edit distance is known as Damerau-Levenstein distance. They all, uh, all of these algorithms, they all basically require a dictionary made as a term frequency list or a bigram frequency list and they try to find the dictionary entry with the smallest edit distance from the query term. Symmetric delete spelling correction algorithm leverages a brilliant delete-only mechanism to improve speed at lookup time. It was originally implemented in C Sharp under the name of Simspell and ported in almost every existing programming language under the same name. We chose it because how fast it is, while maintaining a complete language-independent approach and give good results even with a small site dictionary. The trade-off here is that, together with the dictionary, we build also a list of possible uh, mistakes for every entry of the dictionary. Taken from the Sims per readme, uh, there is a brilliant example. An average of five letter words has three million uh, possible spelling error with a maximum, within a maximum edit distance of three. But Simspell, due to this delete-only mechanism, uh, have to generate only 25 deletes to cover all the three million possibilities. This reduces a lot uh, the time uh, doing a lookup, but increases the memory usage, of course. Also, I mean that is language independent, not only because one can supply mixed language dictionary, but also, but also because we don't need to know the alphabet in order to generate the possible errors. This is uh, particularly useful when uh, dealing with uh, text that mix language that uses a different, uh, uh, different alphabet, like Chinese, Korean, Japanese, and so on. Given the fact that we were able to analyze all the text in our databases, tokenize the words, count the occurrence of the tokens, and build frequency lists for unigrams and bigrams, uh, for, sing for unigrams I mean that I count how many times a token occurs in all text. For bigram I mean that a couple of the two same tokens in the same order appears. This can be done for trigrams, quadgrams, and so on, of course. We were able to build this uh, frequency list and to update it on a daily basis with the new inputs provided by the users. In order to put all of this to work, so what we need to know to do? We need to read the frequency list files, load every token with this frequency into a data structure like a hash map, set a maximum edit distance we want to check for spelling errors, pre-calculate a list for every entry of the possible errors, this is, only uh, this is only feasible, I recall, because of the deletes-only approach, which reduces a lot the possibilities. In fact, uh, other transformations in the strings are always viewed by this algorithm as some sort of deletes, which is brilliant. So next, we have to read the input we want to check, 
split it in, vari in various ways because we cannot assume that a space is always a correct delimiter for our words. In some language spaces they don't even exist, so we cannot rely on them. We have to compare the splits with the dictionary and the generate candidates, score the possibilities and giving back the best results. Luckily, all this complex work is already done in the great amount of implementation of this algorithm in various languages. So, for the first test, we just use the Python version called Sims12Py and expose a view from uh, our Django backends. Every time a user starts in typing in our beautiful JS frontend, the frontend interrogated our backend which responded with the correct sentence. If the sentence match the user input, the sentence is assumed to be correct, otherwise an alert is shown to the user. For sure, this solution worked, but it was an unsustainable resource consumption. It used more CPU time than the rest of our entire backend infrastructure, in fact. Even if the dictionary are loaded only once at the bootstrap of the application. Uh, even if the dictionary are loaded only once, uh, the amount of memory and CPU used for lookups was unmanageable, for a, uh, especially for a considerable amount of users uh, typing at the same time, which is a very common situation where uh, building software for uh, used by entire classroom, entire schools or many schools uh, which have the same time shift. So it was an unpractical solution to be used uh, for real in a produ production environment. Then we started thinking that maybe we could simply offload all this computation directly into the clients. You, user, are responsible for your typos and you are going to use your RAM and your CPU to fix them. There's nothing wrong with this approach. But on the other side, we are all aware on the downside of overloading our front-end JavaScript uh, code with too much computation. JavaScript frameworks uh, are already wasting a lot of resources in doing some questionable uh, operation and the risk of completely destroying the user experience making the web app unresponsive uh, for minutes is uh, straight around the corner. It's then that we learned about WebAssembly and the benefit it could give us in solving such a problem. First of all, I want to briefly explain what WebAssembly is. WebAssembly is, basic, is basically a binary format which represents an abstract syntax tree of instructions for a stack-based virtual machine. It also describes a sandboxed, memory-safe execution environment that can be bundled in various existing environments is uh, meant for the web, but it's not limited to that. Nowadays, it's supported in all major web browsers, such as Firefox, Chrome, Edge, and Safari, and can be, through, it can be used through some JavaScript APIs that allow us to compile modules, store and retrieve them from the local storage, instantiate the module, uh, call the function uh, exported, and so on. When we say that it's not limited to run in a web environment, we can refer as if, uh, for implementation like uh, Node.js and so on. All of this give us some obvious advantages. One is the size of a binary representation format compared to a plain text representation format, like shipping an, the entire module in plain JavaScript. I can assume that it will be more compact and smaller. The other is the efficient execution time given by the fact that the format itself is specified keeping in mind some hardware optimization features available in a wide range of platforms. So we can reasonably hope that over time it will be faster and faster. Like, a, like everything, obviously, it comes with some cons. One overall is that it does not specify any kind of system interface. So we are often limited by the environment we are targeting or what we can do and what we cannot do. In fact, this is not completely true, because a lot of effort are spent in projects like a WebAssembly system interface. Also, if we plan to run our code in a web environment, we can import uh, from to WebAssembly all the web APIs we need. For Rust, there is a, a crate called WebSys that uh, does exactly this. So if we need to the fetch API, we can use uh, the crate WebSys to import the fetch APIs and to uh, download content from the network uh, directly uh, from uh, WebAssembly. Or we can use other things like uh, mscript and APIs to have a sort of uh, system interface. But we have chosen uh, also we have chosen Rust uh, as a language uh, because all the flexibilities and low-level control it offers, while maintaining strong guarantees at compile times about memory and thread safety which make it uh, easy for an inexperienced developer like me to approach a challenge where performance really matters. 
okay, let's say, uh, not uh, so easy, but with more uh, confidence in a program, uh, in a program's behavior after it uh, compiles in uh, memory management and memory related issues. But uh, we also decided to uh, use Rust because WebAssembly is a first citizen target in its tool chain. There is online a lot of documentation and examples on how to develop, build, debug, test, benchmark project uh, targeting WebAssembly architecture. Last but not least, we use uh, Rust because we didn't want to write uh, in C++. For example, to compile uh, a Rust crate uh, for a uh, WebAssembly, all we need to do is to install the correct uh, target with something like Rust app add target wasm32, and then compile our crate with cargo build specifying the correct uh, wasm32 target. That's it. So now that we we have clarified what we want to do and how, let's start our journey into implementing a simple version written in Rust compiled into WebAssembly and used by a front-end written in JavaScript. First of all, we asked ourselves if something like uh, what we wanted to build was made by someone else before us. We found that Simspell has uh, already been ported into Rust language by a single guy who will have my respect forever and ever. Still, it was missing some key improvements to the algorithm implemented the recent version of the original project. So, first of all, we decided to align the crate with the recent improvement, the recent improvement made by C# -sharp developers. One is a better correction quality, using a naive base probability for the selection of uh, sentence splits, and the other one was uh, the support for uh, bigram dictionaries that was implemented by another person in uh, in the same time frame. This was, uh, in fact, the most uh, boring part because it only involved some modification into the mathematics involved into the probability calculation done when uh, the program has to decide which of the various sentence split is the best. Due to the fact uh, that most uh, ports, including this, look more like transcription from the c -sharp version than actual rewrites using the idiomatic constructs of other languages, uh, was, uh, uh, was easy. Nevertheless, uh, I introduced uh, an integer overflow bug discovered after some time by another user. So, easy, but not so easy. So, after doing this, we can say we have an update working version of our crate, but our front-end developers want to npm install it, and we are still far away from there. So, what's next? As we have said before, with WebAssembly, we do not have a direct system interface. That that mean that we cannot use all the facility that the Rust standard library provides to us. Especially, we cannot have direct input-output operation like access uh, to files, uh, uh, reading and writing files, uh, opening socket, uh, and everything relating to that. As said before, that is not ent entirely true. Uh, one can see WebAssembly system interface project and so on. But given the functionalities of this crate, seems reasonable that the input-output operation can be totally avoided. All we should need is a way to pass a dictionary and then a way to pass input to be correct. That's it. So let's check if it is true in, uh, in the first place. With a simple grab over the repo, we can see that uh, our crate actually make use of the standard uh, file system module. As we can see, the load dictionary function expect as a argument a string uh, a string representing a path where the dictionary should be located as a file. So we have a problem, but we have to keep in mind that it is a reasonable choice to embed here the input out operation required by opening a particular file and load its content. There are rare situations where a solution like this won't fit, but unfortunately, we are in one of these uh, rare situations. Also, we, are, uh, we have another problem because we are working on an existing crate, so we cannot break the API changing the signature of one of the most important functions in the library. We are not the, one, uh, the only one using this, and we cannot expect to change the behavior so brutally, leaving the responsibility of loading the dictionary content onto the shoulder of the end users of the crate. We have to find out so a solution for working around this problem without breaking the compatibility. But it turns out that this can be done easier than we thought. In this specific case, 
All we need to do is to wrap the line by line reading logic in a separate function called maybe load dictionary line on something like this and make load dictionary call it on every line of the opened file. Doing this, we hope to leave the original function as is with the same signature and the same uh, logic and to pass to our WebAssembly bundle something that might look uh, uh, like a, uh, a list of line and uh, handle the logic of repeatedly called load dictionary line in, uh, in our binding. This makes all the, all the users happy while avoiding us horrible runtime errors while trying to call file open from uh, the WASM executable. For our use case, this one, the only, let's uh, call them uh, illegal interaction for a WebAssembly environment. But uh, in most cases, the, the code can be reworked in a way like this. So it seems that now we have a crate that can be compiled into WebAssembly and should work. So what we have to do next? We have to set up Cargo to be able to compile it as a dynamic library that is intended to be used from a C-like foreign function interface. What uh, that in Rust parlance is defined as CDYLib. But also, we want to maintain the chance to build uh, as a regular Rust crate called RLib. Also, to uh, expose a nice JavaScript interface we can use uh, from our web app, we need to use something uh, to add some dependency, for example, WasbinGen. WasbinGen is a tool and a library that allow us to build high-level interaction between JavaScript and WebAssembly. So, we need to add some specific dependency, but we don't want to pollute the build for other target with our specific WebAssembly stuff. Luckily, Cargo allows us to specify the uh, dependencies and feature of our library to be exposed only for certain targets with basically zero effort. We can introduce a section called target.wasm32.dependencies and be sure that those crates will be only pulled and compiled when we actually need them. In our case, we are adding wasbingen and serve because we want to pass back and forth uh, uh, structured data uh, between uh, WebAssembly and JavaScript containing input and results uh, of the computation. And with the integration between serve and wasbingen, we can uh, JSON serialize our structure uh, for free. Now, we can dig into wasbingen feature in order to expose them from JS to JS. Wasbingen. We want to reach an interface like this for a Node.js environment, where uh, the Node.js developer uh, require our module and then can construct uh, an instance and call the method uh, to uh, load the dictionary and look up uh, for, the, uh, for the sentence correctness. In order to reach uh, uh, something like this, all we need to do is wrap the functionalities we want to expose from our crate, for example, we don't want to expose the one that used the file system as we've seen before, into a struct, and implement some method we want to, uh, we want to export uh, onto this struct. Marking this struct with some wasbingen macros, this will be polyfilled and exposed to, to JavaScript as a nice uh, JavaScript class. With all the glue code required by JavaScript to compile, load, uh, and uh, call the uh, WebAssembly module, auto-generated in a JavaScript file that can be directly imported. To be clear, all we need to do is something like this. Building a structure, declaring a structure, annotating it with a wasbingen macro, uh, implementing some method, like for example a, a constructor method, and uh, uh, we can give some annotation like uh, uh, JS class which tell uh, or JS name which tell wasbingen that uh, this class, uh, uh, when uh, exposed to JavaScript, will be named simspell and not JS simspell like the Rust name. Also, to pass uh, structured uh, uh, to pass uh, JavaScript object to our constructor and method, we can use the integration between wasbingen and serve. This, give, this gives us the chance to declare uh, arbitrary structs like this one and then use into serde and from serde function to serialize them and be able to pass them back and forth from, uh, from JavaScript. Here is the declaration and here we can see the usage from parameters into serde. Finally, 
in uh, our uh, lib uh, file, we can expose uh, this uh, struct mm -hmm. only when we are targeting uh, uh, WebAssembly or WASM32 architecture. Uh, the, uh, when we are targeting WASM32 as uh, before when installing dependencies. In this case, we can use the config macro like this. This macro tells the compilers uh, to uh, use some declaration like pubuse wasm js simsel only when we are, we are targeting uh, wasm32 and not to expose uh, some uh, and uh, to expose uh, other uh, declaration only when we are not targeting uh, wasm32 so all the rest of the possible architectures we have to pay attention to declare also the external create and the dependency we are going to use according to this uh, to this target or the compiler will complain that we are trying to use stuff that uh, has not been downloaded okay so now we have a nice uh, javascript interface but we are far lazier than this we want to have something that can be published on npm without writing a single line of javascript here comes uh, a tool called waspack Waspack is a companion tool of Wasp Engine that takes care of compiling your code to WebAssembly and generate uh, a package folder for output. This package folder will contain the Wasm binary, uh, the JS wrapper file generated by Wasp Engine, a package JSON file, and a README. Basically, that's all we need to publish something on npm if we want or to install uh, it with, uh, with npm. In order to, to do this, we need to install it in our system Waspack, and this should give uh, us an npm package as an output after building uh, our project. We have to cd in our repo and simply run waspack build. That's it. It will create a pkg folder with all the files required. Of course, that's not so easy. We have to keep in mind what we are going to build, because uh, waspack is able to provide uh, to us uh, like four different flavors of builds. The default one is called uh, bundler type that uh, outputs uh, JavaScript uh, that is suitable for interoperation uh, with uh, bundler like Webpack and to uh, use it in hybrid environments. To import a um, uh, module uh, built with uh, bundler uh, mode, we have to use the JavaScript import keyword and the module keyword is specified in the package JSON file. Then there is the uh, Node.js type which, uh, which uh, give us uh, common JS modules and uh, has, uh, has these, these modules uh, have to be imported using the required statements. The main key is uh, specified in the package JSON files. The web type uh, can be natively imported into a browser as an ECMAScript module, but uh, the WebAssembly uh, um, web assembly module but must be manually loaded and instantiated. Finally, there is the no modules build type, uh, which is very similar uh, to web type, but uh, it uh, modifies the global states of the page. For our case, the bundler type, which is also the default, should fit well because we plan to use it in an hybrid environment using a bundler like Webpack. Okay, now we have a crate that can, that can be conditionally compiled for WebAssembly, that can be used for, uh, from JavaScript as a class, and that can be bundled in an NPM package and loaded directly from uh, Webpack using the appropriate WebAssembly loader. The next question is, in a JavaScript environment, it works? To prove this, we can use a crate called wasbingen test. This is a crate that provides test functionality for WebAssembly target, while remaining as similar as possible to the native uh, unit test facility. After adding it as a dev dependency for our WebAssembly target, we can write down tests annotating them with the uh, wasbingen macro. For uh, adding this as a dev dependency, we can use the same procedure uh, for uh, conditionally add the dependency, uh, specifying dev dependency instead of uh, dependency keyword, of course. As we can see, also the test uh, looks uh, look very similar uh, to their native counterparts. To run them, we can uh, use uh, the helpers provided by Waspack, typing something in our terminal like Waspack test. Waspack test will run our test, taking care of all the rest. Uh, and also, we can specify our target environment uh, with a simple flag. So, uh, for example, if we want to, if you want to run your test on a Node.js environment, you can write down uh, Waspack test node 
and it will uh, execute uh, our your test uh, into a Node.js environment. The same thing can be done for Firefox, Chrome, Safari, or Edge, specifying the appropriate flag. We are now able to say that yes, our npm package is correctly doing what it's supposed to do. We have a test that proves it. Let's let's check if it's worth the effort. The first thing I'm worried about is the size of the, WASM, the WebAssembly module. It has to be downloaded and compiled every time from the network. So if it's bigger than I expect, it could, very, uh, it could be a very big issue. Let's see the in our package directory uh, generated by WASPAC and take a look at the size of the files. As we can see, it's a lot bigger than expected. At these sites, it's almost unusable. I cannot expect a user to download the, a file of these sites every time they open the app. In, the f in order to solve this in the first place, we can attempt to turn on some optimization. We have a lot of optimization uh, tools uh, to try to solve this problem. The first one, maybe, it's uh, cargo built-in profiles that uh, allow us to uh, turn on some optimization flag directly from a cargo tone file. Or we can decide to use uh, some WebAssembly specialized optimization tool, like WASM OPT, which is part of the Binarian uh, suites. Uh, um, they are all great, but in this case they make no significant improvement with the code sites. So the problem, in our case, should be elsewhere. In order to try to solve this, we can use a code, prof a code sites profiler like Twiggy, which supports WebAssembly, to find out why our WebAssembly executable is so big. If we ask Twiggy to print the top 20 code sites offenders in our executable, we can immediately see that something terrible is happening in the data section of our module. Something is taking up almost the 70% of the total sites of the executable. In, uh, we can so use another tool that is very similar to the OBJ dump, but is uh, uh, made with uh, to support WebAssembly. Uh, it's called uh, WASM OBJ dump. We can try to disassemble the data section and take a look into it if we, we can spot something useful. As we can see, it seems that we are populating the executable with a ton of useless words in the data section. But why? and where they come from. After taking a look uh, into the crate and its uh, into the original crate and uh, its dependency, it turns out that uh, the crate has something called string strategy. This, give, this gives the user the opportunity to uh, make some operation on the input text on, on the dictionary text before uh, loading them and checking them. For example, this gives the user the opportunity to transliterate is uh, to transliterate his uh, Unicode inputs into poor ASCII strings. In order to do this, it's, uh, it downloads a, a crate called Unidecode, which embeds uh, in itself some transposition tables to match Unicode code points into the nearest uh, ASCII character. This uh, takes a lot of data to be embedded into the, the binary at compile time. Uh, we decided that in our WebAssembly use case, it's not a very uh, useful feature. So uh, to work around this, we can try to not expose this functionality for WebAssembly and see what happens. To not install this uh, Unidecode crate, we can use a little more complex cargo config feature to not install the crate when we are building for WebAssembly, like this target.config when not target architecture is WASM32 dependency Unidecode. And uh, to hide completely the ASCII string strategy, which uh, uses uh, this, uh, this crate, in order to expose it only where we are building for the, uh, all the rest of the architecture, without breaking the compatibility with the original crate. Let's see if something changes. It seems that, yes, the executable is a lot smaller, like we saved the 70% of the, the sites. A lot of uh, this uh, make it uh, like more usable for uh, for end users, but there are uh, a lot of uh, uh, also Twiggy can uh, confirm that no uh, data section is not involved in uh, code uh, sites uh, of tenders anymore. But uh, the um, code sites can depend on a more complex factor, like. Uh, 
to avoid and reduce your code size, you should avoid completely a string formatting operation. That in our case it's not possible because we don't uh, we want to uh, do exactly this uh, these tasks. And also removing completely planning infrastructure can be useful because it brings a lot of code bloat. Last but not least, if uh, we use uh, trait objects instead uh, of uh, generic trait parameters, uh, uh, we can reduce the code size of our executable because when using generic traits parameter, the compiler uh, makes a, a copy of the function for every type uh, that implements the trait, uh, and so uh, this uh, increases uh, the, the code size. Trait objects uh, leverages the dynamic dispatching features, so they don't uh, make a, a, co a copy of the function. In this situation, tool tools like uh, Wasmo PT, Twiggy, Wasmo BJ Dump can be life saving into troubleshooting more sub issue than one I show it to you that was a very big and evident issue. Also, there is a tool uh, worth a look that's called Wasmsnip. Wasmsnip allows you to replace some function with an reachable statement. This, solve, uh, this is very useful if you know that one function will never be called at runtime, but the compiler is not able to uh, prove it, so it keeps bundling this function into the module. Also, it removes all the function can called only by the function you are going to snip, so it can reduce a lot the code size if there is a chain of uh, function uh, that uh, is not uh, that uh, they become unreachable. So. Now that we have reduced significantly the, the code size of the NPM module, of the WASM module, we have an NPM package we can, which can be installed and loaded onto hybrid environments uh, which use bundler like Webpack, is tested for the environment is supposed to run on and has been optimized for a, a reasonable size for everyday usage. The only thing left to do left to do is to let our front-end developer to install it, load with the appropriate uh, webpack loader, for example, and use it. And we uh, made all of this without writing a single line of JavaScript code. If you want to check the project uh, I've uh, talked about, you can do it on GitHub here at this, uh, at this link. And I, I've finished. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope this can be useful for one to want to start playing with Rust and, uh, and WebAssembly. Thank you very much. All right, everyone, welcome back. And uh, we are now ready to go live with Nicola to answer any questions or elaborate. So let's bring him on. Hello there, Nicola. Welcome back. Uh, let's see, I cannot hear you actually. Can you test your microphone? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Great, great. Well, uh, first of all, before we get started with the questions, thanks for being here for Rust Lab, even if it's virtually this year. Yeah, thank you for this great opportunity to sharing my experiment with, uh, with Rust. It's a great uh, chance. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. It was very interesting to see that. I'd love to see what other people can do with that implementation. Um, do you have anything to say about your participation in the event or anything else you wanted to add? Uh, no, I think that uh, I want uh, to add that uh, I found uh, very interesting uh, topics and uh, talk uh, in, this, uh, in this conference. So it was uh, a pleasure to hear other than uh, to talk here. It's was uh, an honor. Thank you. Yeah, thank you as well. Um, so I think we have a few minutes left. Uh, actually, we've got about 10 minutes left. I don't actually see any relevant questions other than a microphone one. Um, <laughs> got the problem, but... Yeah, sorry about that. We're, um, you know, being live uh, and with technology, sometimes we get some issues with that. Oh, but um, that's fine. Um, oh, okay. We've got a question from Anil Chati, who says, "Great talk. Is it possible to share the GitHub link in the chat window?" Yes, for sure. Here it is. 
Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, it's always great to see those links so people can play around with it later. Awesome. All right. Well, I didn't hear or see any other questions. If um, if anyone's typing, can you quickly say wait? <laughs> and we'll, uh, we'll wait for your chat. Um, another question could be just for everyone. Uh, what did you find most useful or most interesting or surprising from, from Nihola's uh, chat today? Everyone's so quiet today. All right. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. So while we're waiting, uh, maybe for just one question to come up, uh, Nicola, where are you located at? I'm located in uh, Turin, Italy. North in Turin, that's right. You said it yeah. before at the very beginning. I even heard you say that. <laughs> Sorry. My memory just goes away. All right. Well, if we don't have any questions, I guess. Oh, we do. We do. Good, good, good. Okay. <laughs> I'm glad to see that. Okay. Our first question from Anil Chatti. Did you notice a good improvement, uh, good performance improvement by using the Rust crate in your client app? Uh, yes, uh, it's two um, like uh, from two use cases, like I stated in the recording. Uh, firstly, we used the uh, uh, backend side uh, side implementation of this feature, and uh, yes, for our server side uh, code, it was a big relief to be offloaded of this uh, computation complexity into into the client. I don't know uh, from a plain uh, JavaScript implementation because uh, we have not uh, um, tested some pure JavaScript uh, library that uh, solves uh, this uh, problem checking, uh, this uh, spell checking uh, issue. But uh, I can reasonably think that uh, yes, it will be a good performance improvement also because of the code, uh, the binary representation format is uh, a lot uh, faster to be compiled and uh, execute in uh, the web browser uh, virtual, uh, uh, web assembly virtual machine. So I think, uh, yes, in uh, the two cases, uh, like a server side implementation and uh, uh, pure JavaScript implementation, uh, yes, we noticed a good performance improvement, for sure. Awesome, thank you for that. We've got another question by Roman who says, uh, which WASM runtime do you prefer? Uh, yes, uh, like uh, for um, Rust uh, target, uh, we mainly use the WASM 32 unknown unknown um, target because uh, like uh, I, think that it's the most uh, flexible. Also, we played uh, a little bit with uh, M scripts and APIs, but uh, I have not uh, dig uh, so so deeply, so I cannot say that uh, if uh, there are uh, significant uh, improvement uh, in uh, performance or issue like uh, like that. Uh, but uh, I think, uh, yeah, that's uh, also, we have uh, experimented a little bit with uh, Node.js and uh, also for um, like uh, server side integration in uh, code uh, running under Node.js can be a great, uh, great improvement uh, loading and using uh, WebAssembly modules. Okay, thank you for that. All right, if we, oh, we do have a good, another question. Yay, all right, Alessandro Baldo says, hello, nice talk. Two questions. The first one is, how do you see using Wasm also on backend? Yes, uh, as I said, uh, like uh, if you uh, run uh, on uh, uh, Node.js backend, the Wasm integration come uh, absolutely for free because it's already supported and uh, well integrated. Uh, one thing to keep in mind uh, using uh, WebAssembly on the uh, backend uh, for server-side code for sure is to uh, think about that, um, uh, that the system interfaces so, or uh, like uh, everything related to uh, like multi-threading, uh, uh, file opening, socket opening and so on is uh, not specified by the, the format itself. So you have to keep in mind that the, the WebAssembly have some limitation on doing this kind of thing. Although some uh, a lot of efforts are spent in uh, in solving this kind of problem, 
I'm very interested in looking at the WebAssembly system interface and uh, how it manages to solve uh, solve this uh, this kind of problem, which I think is the biggest when using uh, WebAssembly at uh, at this time. Also for the multi-threading uh, uh, multi-threading opportunity. Uh, a lot of efforts are spent in this uh, in this uh, in this way to support uh, natively from uh, WebAssembly multi threading. There are some uh, uh, some facility one can uh, can use. I don't know for backend code because I have not played with it uh, so much. But uh, for sure for uh, the integration into the client and to, into the web browser, one can leverage the Web Worker API. They are, they are limited in some way, especially for the synchronization uh, mechanism between threads, but a lot of efforts are spent in solving this. So I hope in the future will be for sure better. And uh, in, um, for the second question, uh, I think that the most uh, boring part uh, of the porting, as I said, uh, was the uh, algorithmic and mathematic uh, improvement uh, uh, spent uh, uh, the algorithmic uh, improvement we had to implement to have a uh, like thin, thin set version uh, with the original implementation because it was more uh, transcription than a real reporting. So I think that uh, that was the most boring part for sure. Mm. Yeah, it must have been a little tedious. For sure. All right. Well, thank you for that, everyone. Um, if you have any other questions, we'll ask them now. OK, Alessandro says thank you. All right. Um, I guess that's about it. Do you have anything else you would like to add, Nicola? No, I want to thank you, everyone, for listening to me and my little experiments. Thank you again. Yeah, of course. We're, we're really happy to have you here. And uh, we definitely hope to see you with the next edition, hopefully live. We'll see. We will try. <laughs> all right. All right. Well, thank you again so much. And um, I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you, too. Thanks. All right. So, you guys, if that is it, um, well, I just want to say thank you all for coming. This marks the end of Rust Lab 2020. Um, you can also rate this talk on the agenda page of Rust Lab if you'd like. Um, so thanks for all of our speakers. Thanks for the participants. And uh, we hope next year's edition will be just as great, if not better. And a uh, last thing, please stay tuned um, at 4.15. So in just about half an hour, we will have a little surprise uh, brought to you by Matteo Banchi from Develer um, for the closing of the Rust Lab conference. So uh, stay tuned for that little surprise. We'll see you in a bit. Everyone, hope you enjoyed Rust Lab, and we'll see you next year. Goodbye.